Welcome, everyone. Good evening to the May 5th Cinco de Mayo version of Robot Builders Night Virtual. Here we go. Wow, so amazing. tonight, a uh, few of us are warming up, and uh, I guess the idea is to just kind of walk around and see who has what to show tonight. And then if we could, I'd like to reserve a couple moments and decide uh, what to do about the upcoming uh, monthly meetings scheduled for this coming Saturday. But first, let's just walk around the table. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll start off this time after going last so many times. Although I made some progress on my donkey car to 2016 Club Robot project this weekend, I, I quickly discovered that, uh, as it turns out, uh, Linux, Raspbian is probably not the best way to implement a spy port. Uh, in Python code. So it, probably the better way would be to use actual kernel level driver implementation uh, because I noticed that uh, my, uh, my protocol was running cleanly by itself and it would run cleanly when I had the donkey car loop at like 10 hertz or 15 hertz. But when I took the donkey car loop to 20 hertz, then whatever the donkey car loop was doing would really screw up my protocol loop. So my spy interface. So uh, it'll be very interesting to when we when we get around to Murray to to hear how he's been doing with his uh, from what I know, call it I two C exercises or whatever wherever that direction has gone. But uh, yeah. so I am I have nothing to show this week. Just some uh, a little bit of babbling, and we'll call that the end of my babbling for now. Hopefully next week I'll have more to show. My intention is still to get the donkey car running. Uh, club car donkey bot running and trained and uh, driving autonomous, autonomously. So, uh, so I'm going to park it there and then hand over uh, roughly in order of joining. How's that sound this week? So that would be, I think, Ray, you might have been next. Yeah. And you said you had some stuff to show. Yeah, I've been working on, um, I've actually been trying to replace, um, you know, a an RC type controller with um hc12 modules and the hc12 modules are they're kind of short range I, the claim in the in the lowest um baud rate which is like i think 1200 bps you can go you know they claim a thousand meters um so it's you know the faster the rate the shorter the distance that you can transmit uh and receive so these are pretty small modules and I made a kind of a little box to hold it See if I can hold it up to the camera and um, that's actually the HC12 module there and I have a, a, a mega and a, um, a little switch mode power supply there's actually a battery in the bottom of the case and that's the antenna for the HC12 so um and at uh one of the tanner spines i got one of the um got my my image here looks pretty pretty dim uh i guess it's it's an ibm uh joystick they were really cheap they were like i don't know three or four bucks and um hooked it up to the um to the little board and so it's that was kind of my attempt to make um um kind of a substitute for an RC controller. So um, had it on, you know, on my desk and was transmitting and receiving on the other end and then um, hooked it up to the mower platform and um, it doesn't work. So I've got to figure out what's going on. So um, transferring it over from, you know, just a breadboard on, on my desk over there, I've, I've done something wrong. So don't know what that is yet. Kind of in the process of finding that. So, anyway. Can you hold again? Just hold Go the joystick ahead. up for a moment. Uh, oh, you... yeah. And then I had a question on the joystick. Yeah. Like, what? what's the interface on that deal? Do you, are there easy to find drivers out there? Or this, there's, you know, it's like bare bones joystick. There's um, a cable with. One, two, three, four, five, six wires coming out of it. Um, 
one for each axis of the joystick and then two buttons and power and ground. So and that's kind of it. There's no no other circuitry in the box except the, the joystick and two switches. And there's a you know a little wired cable that comes out that I wired into this box. Um, if you look at how linear they are, I, I, like compared to those RF ones that I've been using, uh, the PS2 controllers, do, do they seem to have a better uh, range of control? Um, that's what's kind of nice. You can, you know, you can read it with the A to D inputs on a Arduino and scale it to whatever you want. Um, so you can, eh, <clears throat> you know, uh, with it, you can just set the max range to five volts and you can get, you know, 1,023 counts out of it pretty much. Um, as far as linearity, I, I really haven't checked it out to, I, I don't know, I thought most joysticks were linear. They weren't like log. Um, oh, um, well, the, the, the reason I mentioned that is that, uh, like, if you look at, at my screen here, the, uh, like these guys. Yeah. Oh, here's Mr. Edwards tonight. Welcome, Steve. But if you look at these guys, I think as we've found, uh, you've, like, there's a very narrow range of angular motion to begin with. Yeah. And what I found is that, uh, you'd have to move it to about here before it gets the minimum change from dead center. And then by about, I don't know, a few degrees later, you're at full max. So the range yeah. of control is so narrow. It's, I was really disappointed to find that out. Oh, and yeah. I, because compared to a standard RC controller, and I imagine compared to the one you have, I bet you have a much wider range of motion, which you can control and divvy up a thousand times. Yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of what I liked about it. It is, it is, it's kind of big and gawky looking, but um, you know, it's got mechanically, it's got a pretty wide throw. Like you can, you know, that's oh, I don't know, probably at least two inches side mm. to side. It's and, more like you know, a traditional yeah, yeah, controller you know, in that regards, right? Yeah. So um, it's kind of like the Dudley Moore movie where you know the caucasians are just too damn big you know we need big stuff like this you know <laughs> one of those yeah. little little asian joysticks you know so <laughs> okay. but you say they're available on banggood too if you look for them right oh the the joystick controller yeah oh no that was a tanner thing <laughs> oh, okay um he got a bunch of i guess it was ibm junior stuff in or PC Junior, and from this guy, I guess he had it, you know, some stockpile for the 80s. And yeah. you remember um, um, Dale Wheat came in and he had a bunch of, he was playing around with them, so was... Um, David. Um, David. 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 Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of which, has anybody heard from David? Not recently. Oh, maybe we should check up on him. Yeah, I was thinking we ought to check up on Richard too. Uh, you know, oh, really? you know, he's been really quiet. Huh. Well, hopefully they're both okay. Um. Anyway, so it's it's you know, the box. It's you know, it's kind of like the first Bomar brain calculators. You know, it's like. The <laughs> They were huge, and all it did is add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But yeah, in comparison to uh, you know to the little ones like this that are actually on, uh, um, oh, yeah. you know those controllers, um, it it seems to have much more much more movement and adjustability. So even though it is I don't know twenty times the size. Um, well, Ray, I was just digging around on various Pololu and Adafruit and all the sites, and most of them sell those little tiny ones. But it turns out that the only place I can find, at least from the ones I've looked, like Robot Shop and everything, is Pimeroni sells two larger ones. One that has it's a full joystick like yours, but not as big. And they've also got the style from the arcade games with the big ball on the top that moves this way. Oh, yeah, yeah. And those aren't too expensive, they're six pounds, but they're big. They're like you know, a big giant joystick that actually moves not as a angle, but this way. Uh -huh, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, I know you can get replacement joysticks for RC controllers on Bank. I've seen them there. Ah, okay. So that might be another option. You know, you could just 3D print a little box. And if you really wanted mm -hmm. a larger, you know, then something bigger than one of these things. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like a throwback to the, uh, I don't know, I guess that would be early 80s, you know, where. Kind of Terminator oh, no. Terminator One, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where stuff was actually that big. So. <laughs> yeah. As big as Arnie. Yeah. Nice. Anyway, so that's what I've been playing with. Cool. All right. Thanks. Mm. What's well, the next in line? Murray, I think you were the next to join. And uh, sounds like you've been doing uh, machine computer to computer interprocessor communication things. Yeah, I haven't really done hardly any hardware, although I soldered a whole bunch of those Pololu connectors to the IR things, those little tiny, tiny connectors. So I've got a bunch of uh, new infrared, analog infrared sensors, which are going on the robot. Um, but I've spent most of my time in software, and I haven't for years done anything with Arduinos, but I've got an Arduino Micro, and I've customized the IDE so it's to my liking. And what I've got, I'll probably publish because I first started to make it for myself, and now it's turned into kind of a general utility. And what it is, it's a Arduino slave Raspberry Pi master that communicates two bytes at a time. And that's all it needs. So it doesn't have to have any clock slowing or anything like that. I tried wiring Pi, Fermata, a whole bunch of stuff. I ended up just doing a standard connection between the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi using I2, I squared C, which was my original intention. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying there's as many as 32 pins on an Arduino, which isn't quite true, but for most of them it is. And so any number passed as a byte across to the Arduino, if it's up to 32, it will be interpreted as a call to either send a value to an output pin or return a value from an existing pin. And then numbers bigger than that actually are in, like anything with, uh, anyway, basically there's offsets, a 32 and a 64 and a 96 offset from that that are interpreted as commands. So what I've got basically is a Python class that knows how to send those commands. So I can basically configure the Arduino from the Pi. So I can basically send it commands to configure the pins from the Pi and then start receiving either analog or digital values from the Arduino. And so far it's working. And I thought someone would have done this before, but I couldn't find anything. And it's actually working pretty well. I've actually got kind of a loop going now where I can, can, I can send four commands from the Raspberry Pi to configure one output pin and three input pins. I've got, um, I don't know if I can hold it up here exactly, but that is, that board on the top of the robot is actually the Arduino Micro. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, yeah. And, and basically, I've got a button, an LED, a digital, and an analog infrared sensor as my samplers. And I've uh, been so far successful with this. And if it works, I, I guess I'll try to figure out how to get GitHub working as a public place to post the code. Mm -hmm. But it would probably be useful for anybody who wanted to use an Arduino as an I squared C device, because that was my intention. I just want to, I'm going to take all the sensors that are currently plugged into my Raspberry Pi, all the bumpers, all the um, digital and analog infrareds, and stop funneling them into the Raspberry Pi, put them all into the Arduino, and then just call the Arduino on a 20 millisecond loop saying, what do you got? Any bumpers, you know, whatever. And the Arduino will do all the work, and then I'll just get data back from it in the Raspberry Pi, which was the intention. So. I guess that's a success for the project. That's nice. So, did you by any chance measure how long it takes I squared G to transfer those two bytes? No time at all. So it, it, I mean, it, it's running at 100, what is it, 100? I can't remember what the I squared C bus is at. I'm not slowing it down, though. It's as fast as you call it, it comes back. It's, it's, it's as fast as any I squared C device. So, like, I've got these little, um, uh, the little tiny uh, breakout garden sensors, and you call them, they get data back, and this is exactly like that. So it's there's no delay that I can see. Okay, I'm just curious. I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't put it on the oscilloscope or anything like that, but the idea <laughs> was, 
<laughs> the idea was to create a Arduino as a sensor, you know, as a collector. And I can now do that. I can basically send it some commands to configure its pins and then just call it and it'll give me data based on, on the address of what pin I want. So I say, you know, I basically send set pin eight to be an, uh, an analog. And then when I call at pin eight plus 96, I think it is, I'll get back the data for that pin. And it's fast, so it works pretty well, actually. Cool. Yeah, so that's that's my success. Apart from that, I haven't been doing any hardware. <laughs> Some of you've had a pretty busy week there. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on here. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. All right. Well, that's it for me. Right. All right, I think uh, continuing in the order of who jumped in, uh, <laughs> And Doug, who's just added to the chat line, the default Raspberry Pi speed is 400 kilobits per second. Yes, and I squared C. So. Doug, I think you might have been third to join. Uh, are there some other things you had to share over this week? Interesting project progress? Okay, two things. Uh, you know, last week I mentioned about doing a virtual class. I'm going to have to back off on that because uh, my wife's going through a new set of therapy so oh boy you know, probably won't be able to do that until that gets gets into a routine um and then i guess the other the thing i've been mainly working with and have been lucky successful with is uh getting the pi the uh, serial port on the on the the max go or max bit to to work so now i can just I should be able to write Python and send the results over to my, uh, to my, uh, whether it's going to be an, I think right now for my test robot, it's going to be a, it's going to be a mega. Uh, for another robot, it might, I might just go ahead and because it bite the bullet and do an arm. But right now, but right now, the way you saw the robot last week, the one that looked like this, <laughs> okay. Get on again. See, so it's got it's basically got a uh, a mega on it. Uh, Ray, you said you had a mega, but you meant nano, didn't you? Nano, didn't you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the mega's on the uh, on the robot. But this is a nano. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess I'd also say I think Murray that I'm loading. You know, really. Of the inconsistent latency on uh, the Raspberry Pi, I would think that your your strategy sounds good, it sounds good. You want to get uh, all your sensors and everything on your on your microprocessor. Not only that, it'll be simpler and just yeah. communicate. Yes, communicate. Um, all I can tell you is make sure you have the uh, what do they call them? The pull up resistor is correct. Mm. I don't believe I don't believe the Raspberry Pi has pull up pull up resistors, so you'll probably have to add them. And I don't remember the Arduino, but you don't want to have two. And you have to, if you want to, keep it at three point three volts, which you do. Uh, I believe you have to power them, power your pull ups with the three point three volts. Actually, there's two, two answers to that. Um, one is that I'm currently using an Arduino Micro at 5 volt, but I've got an order in for an Arduino Nano BLE Sense, which is a 3.3 volt device. So what I'm currently doing is giving the Arduino 5 volts from my 5 volt supply on the robot. But eventually, I'll just, because um, if I got one of these things, uh, let's see. You guys have seen these before, right? The little um, Pimeroni connectors. They're from the Breakout Garden, and they basically they're I I squared C connectors, and they have basically SDA SCL ground uh, interrupt that I never use, and 3.3 volts. So I'll be able to basically plug the Arduino into one of these as if it was a sensor. Um, and okay. it, oh, the part of that is that um, I'm pretty sure you would know this is that. When you configure an input pin on the Arduino, you can configure it as either input or input pull-up, and so they've yeah. got already on there. Yeah, but those are pretty weak. 
I mean, you can do that, uh, but it'll. But if you do that, you got to make sure you're not using because that's going to be tied to five volts. Mm. Okay, and you don't you don't want you don't want your I squared C lines going from zero to five volts. You want them to go from zero to three point three if you're using a Raspberry Pi, and you just yep. have to be careful about how you do that. Uh, you know, I knew that stuff at one time, but I can't tell you where exactly. But you have to you have to be careful with where you pull the pull, pull how you power the pull up, where the pull up resistors DCC yeah. is. You have to be yeah, careful about that. And you also have to be careful that you don't cross. You don't have five volts on one side and three volts on the other. There's mm -hmm. a and you can screw this up a lot of ways. Let me put it that way. Yeah, okay. I gotcha. Well, I think that the goal, like I said, is I've got an order in for a 3.3 volt Arduino, and that will just solve that. I won't have to worry about the 5 volt issue at all. Yeah, that's cool. There's also that new Chinese Arduino that uh, uses a board that can you can easily run on 3.3, and also it doubles the speed, clocks 32 instead of 16, uh, you know, yeah. about 4 bucks. So, I mean... You know, four bucks buys you a good slew of good boards now, though. So mm. you just have to pick one. Yeah. I'll just give David an update since he showed up with my brief presentation. Um, I've actually got some Python code on the Raspberry Pi talking to some an Arduino script, and they communicate two bytes at a time back and forth, and I'm actually interpreting the bytes on the Arduino as configuration to set the pins up. And so I've eventually I'll publish this, but basically I've now got it so that an Arduino can act as a sensor on an I squared C bus on the Raspberry Pi side of things. And so I'm going to plug all my sensors onto the Arduino and just talk to it rather than talking to the sensors. So that's kind of a next, success story. Next step is just to move all the rest of the robot code onto their Arduino. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> I like and then code... And then just use assembly language. Yeah, yeah. I like Python. I'm trying to learn Python. <laughs> I have an investment now. So anyway. <laughs> straight to Py assembly. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So they're, well, talking, they're talking I squared C to each other? Yeah, two bytes at a time. And I basically fire up the Arduino unconfigured, and I send some commands from Python over to the Arduino and configure its pins from the Pi, and then I can call them based on I up to 32 pins. What I'm doing is the first 32 are basically calls for data from those pins. Anything offset from that, either 32 or 64 or 96 higher than that, is a command. So are you going to read the sensors just raw from the pins, or will you actually have drivers on the Arduino? I the, okay. The only thing that I've got on the Arduino that will be used will be either bumper sensors, so they're just switches, and a whole bunch of uh, of the 2.7 volt uh, sharp infrared sensors. So, uh, not none of the more complicated sensors. They'll stay on the Raspberry Pi, but all the smaller sensors like bumpers and infrared will all go over to the Arduino. I guess the first thing I would would think that is, are you not going to have some sort of Gyro or IMU, if you are, you're probably going to want to do that. It'll probably be I squared C. I've saying. heard oh, yeah. So now you're going to have to have, be able to be a master to something. So um, you have to think about that. Yeah. The other thing is, is that the particular Arduino that I've bought, which I haven't got yet, actually has a nine degree of freedom sensor in it. It's got a magnetometer and everything in it. So I'm going to experiment with that. If I like it, I might use it. I've already got, I think I've got actually five degree yeah. of freedom sensors now. So I just need to figure out which one I want to use. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, if memory serves right, I think John and then maybe Clay was next. So John, how's it been going for you this week? Any project progress? Uh, in my case, uh, no, I really didn't get to a project. I, really, I did go by Tanner's, um, what was that, Friday, <laughs> briefly. So, yeah, kept my distance, <laughs> wear the mask, but yeah, I had to go by there one last time to get 
a couple things, including a real keypad for. So I didn't get to the project I had hoped to work on, which was to put uh, arms on this thing. I'm debating and see about exactly how I'm going to do it. I'll probably add another layer box to it. This is my thinking. Have the arms come out the side. So that's sort of the plan. Hopefully next week I'll get to that. And then from there, eventually work on the robot that I had built back a couple years back for outdoors with the GPS thing. Yeah. So hopefully I'll start with that as the project for this one. So that's probably it. So that sounds like this week's theme for us in general. There's a lot of backlog and a little teeny little bit of progress. Um, so Dave Anderson is indicating a voice issue. And uh, isn't it star something, Dave, to unmute? Yeah, you're muted, Dave. I don't know. I think he knew that, uh, but he was struggling. Does he have the dial-in info if he, if he needs to call on a cell? Yeah, he he. Uh, we worked out the process, Steve, where he can dial in the web page and have the web page call his phone, and Hangouts binds them together. So he should be able to mute and unmute his landline and cell phone from the web page, but it doesn't seem to be working. Mm -hmm. And Hangout security thing is such that we can't unmute you, Dave. You have to find the control. You have to find it within yourself to unmute your own audio. If if he's using the window, I am. There you go. At the, no talk. I uh, got it. I was going to say it's the bottom. It's just that out here in the garage, I don't have good cell reception, and my phone just dropped the connection. So that that I was gone, and I back in. Can you hear me now? We got yep. you. Yeah. Yeah. Can't hear you because I just plugged in my phone and I have my head. Try that again. How about now? Yep. Yeah. We can okay. hear you. Can you hear us? Uh, Yes, I can. Awesome. So I just I have bad reception out here in the garage for my uh, for my phone, and it just dropped the the audio. Bummer. Okay. Well, uh, good to have you back with us. All right. So I, I imagine it will do that some more as the evening progresses. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, okay. So next in line, we're kind of going in order of arrival. So Clay, uh, have you had any luck with projects, or have you been doing day job things? Uh, I just unmuted. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yep. Yes, I've been working on something I'll show you. I did want to mention two business-related things. Uh, one is I contacted Cynthia Rivers, and we have permission to uh, digitize the old VHS tapes. Uh, I have some of those. I'm trying to get my setup uh, to start on that. And we should be able to get the ones I don't have also. Uh, we do have to give credit to Cynthia for the video, but other than that, we have permission. And the Great. second thing is, I also went to Tanner's and I gave uh, Jim a thank you note that I wrote. And I did say on behalf of myself and all DPRG members, you know, just to, to thank you. Great. Thank and you. I'm uh, unemployed, and so I'm uh, aggressively looking for work. And I do have a phone interview Friday, so I'm excited about that. And it's with a company that does some virtual reality, augmented reality kind of stuff. So what I've been working on is uh, I, I, my hello world, so to speak, of virtual reality. So what I did was I, I took my robot uh which has a camera and i have some vis basic you know vision stuff i've done for the line following and i've created something I, I wanted to show you i call it video chalk and what video chalk is as if i was going up to a chalkboard and writing on the board with chalk i'm going to go up to a blank wall and i'm going to have the robot track where I'm drawing with my virtual chalk, which is uh, this this screwdriver here, <laughs> this black screwdriver. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. And the uh, robot will track uh, and draw a, a line. So I'm going to move the webcam. So I, I can't really see that well here. And my webcam cord is a little short. There we go. 
Um, so you can see I have my robot with its camera and I pointed the camera up. It normally looks almost down uh, to see the line following course. And then on the wall, I've taped a piece of poster board and uh, I put some uh, kind of border markings so I know where I'm at. I uh, just started on this code. It's a little uh, half baked, but uh, I'll show you what it does. So I'm going to share my screen here if I can figure out how to do that. And let me know if you're seeing this screen now. Yep, it's coming up. So this is a VNC into the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I've got my code video chalk running. And this is the uh, image. So I'm stepping over now, and there's my hand. So if I put the uh, black screwdriver, it should, <laughs> fingers crossed, it worked at home. I'm still at home, though. And now, yeah. if you can see, there's a little uh, crosshair at the tip of the screwdriver. Yeah. I don't know if you can see that. Red cross. And it tracks the tip of the screwdriver. Cool. So I'm going to turn on the tracking, and now everywhere I go, it tracks. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that's cool. cool. And then I can turn the tracking off, and I can hit E for erase. Ah, that's cool. And what that's I want to do, sweet. I want to show this for the interview to show them something cool that I can do. You can well, I highly you. recommend you take a video of it, and not you know, as a backup, <laughs> just demo problems. Oh yeah, boy, that's pretty phenomenal, Clay. That's that's great. That's great, Clay. You could. Oh, that's my right? hello world in uh, virtual reality. <laughs> oh, excellent, cool. excellent. And this is kind of like augmented reality, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you're aug augmenting reality. Exactly. Yeah, making it better. That's right. Okay, I told totally it better than real. <laughs> to stop sharing, I, I let's see. Uh, hopefully, I'm I'm back on. I can't hey, see you myself. Could, but. You could draw mustaches on people you don't like. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was funny because you know I'm all excited, and I tell my son about this, and he says. Dad, you know there's apps on the phone that can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, the, the thing I want to show is that I, I can do this on low-level hardware with low-level code. I didn't use any image processing. This is just pure Python. And, wow. you know, it's just, just a start. Yeah, cool. That's good. That's awesome. Yeah, during, during I think it's worth the price of admission. If, if that doesn't land you what it needs to land you, that and nothing will. Okay, During but uh, I did see that they have over 120 applicants for this job, so uh, <laughs> it's going to be tough. Well, if you don't get it, you can claim that you're one of those under misunderstood geniuses. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> that. That's all I had. Clay, you should write well, hire me in the uh, <laughs> board. <you know>? Okay, <laughs> that's a great idea. If you, anybody has other ideas, let me know. I need I need a wow factor on this presentation. That would be it, I think. You know. Okay. Yeah. That sounds pretty well, awesome. Actually, Fire me. Yeah. Good luck. Well, that's, yeah. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, next in line, Kareem. I think you might have been next to join. How did it go with you this week? Any any luck on fun stuff or just chores, chores, chores? After the mute button. Couldn't get my mute. Couldn't get my unmute, Sean. Um, I have been playing around a little bit with learning um, about RTK GPS, and uh, I had asked some questions about it on the chat last weekend or last last Tuesday. And uh, um, since then, I got one of those SparkFun um, uh, GPS RTK boards, and I've just been playing around with it, sort of huh? learning U Center, which is the primary application for it. Um, yeah. I actually got two of them. 
because I was assuming I'd have to have have to create my own base station. Um, and it turns out I managed to find a local uh, correction station that's broadcasting for free here. Mm, you did? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, right. Uh, let me show it real quick. So this is the board. You guys seen it? No. Yes or no? No. Okay. no. 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 Trying to present. Try one more time. Chair. Is it the more expensive, more accurate one, or the lesser expensive, less accurate one? That's a good question. Go. It's, uh, it's 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 expensive enough for me. Uh, oh, yeah. About two. Is this the more expensive one or the lesser? I think huh? it's the more expensive. One. Uh, so this one comes with the SMA connector, uh, SMA connector already on it, and um, I ordered uh, an L2 capable um, antenna, but it hasn't come in yet, so I'm using an L1 right now. Um, but uh, real quick, I'll show you that um, this is something called RTK to go. Um, and it is a sort of ad hoc free network. There's no guarantees about how reliable these stations are. Um, but I'll go to search on Dallas. So this guy right here, VN1, is broadcasting on RTK to go. And uh, if we map it, See if it'll give me a map. So it seems to be somewhere in uh, Garland. Um, huh. Let me zoom out a little bit. So basically near Plano Road and LBJ. And uh, this over here, the blue dot, is my house. So it's about 10 miles distant. And uh, and I seem to be getting a you know a fairly decent reading. So here's the U center, um, and I don't know if you can tell, but there's a little green dot in the middle of this. Um, yeah. There's something broken with this version of U center. You used to be able to uh, apparently zoom in more than 100%, but it just zooms back out again right away. Um, so I can't really focus in on it deeper. But this is a table in our, in my backyard in my redneck backyard and uh and it's and it's a pretty solid now i don't know what happened because i just lost it but up, up here it says that i'm back down to a 3d float as my fixed mode if it says 3d fixed i'm really down in the like two centimeters um of accuracy yeah. range so and you've seen that level huh, you, you, huh? You've, seen, you've seen the two centimeter level i have yeah wow I have no idea why it's not right now, but um, but it's not. Um, this is the uh, uh, this is the correction feed. Are you getting the corrections over the air that they're broadcasting, or through the web? No, it's coming through the internet. Okay. So so right now, this is not on a robot. It's just. Uh, I just have the antenna sitting outside. The board is in here connected to my laptop. Um, and so it looks like a, um, a serial connection, uh, COM4 on my laptop. And then the, uh, but then the laptop's also connected to the the NTRIP server at rtk2go.com. And, uh, and so it's getting its correction from that particular, forget what they call it, a mount point or something like that. Um, is the specific correction source. It seems to be the only one in the area. So yeah. if anybody else needs one closer to where I am, I can set up uh, my own correction station and connect it to RTK to go. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to just use that one and have the opportunity to put get two robots roaming about the house. Nice. Very, very That's all I've been cool. up to. Well, did you mean outside, not in your house, right? I do mean outside. I first set it up inside the house, and it was like zooming all over the place. Um, but uh, in interestingly, it was finding the GLONASS satellites. 
this section right here, the solid green block is like all of the satellites it's picking up right now. So it's picking up multiple constellations. And uh, and it looked like the Russian ones had the strongest signal. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Thank you, Vladimir. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. That's pretty cool. Hey, it's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So, uh, well, you guys already had a presentation about it, but uh, I wasn't there that how, day. And, how uh, will you do this? Uh, how will you configure that on the outdoor robots? Will they have a local wireless net to get uh, the correct to get to the internet? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm also looking at LoRa as a um, yeah. as a radio source, um, but that seems to be line of sight, and it would still I'd still have to be sort of broadcasting from the house. Um, yeah. And uh, and LoRa is considered not quite high enough bandwidth. You need uh, you need those corrections coming in and coming in about once a second, and uh, and it's right on the edge of what LoRa can can deliver. Um, but I'm mostly planning on operating it in and around the house and. And uh, for like roaming tests, so I do want uh, I do have a we have a uh, experimental cart um, that is capable of going up to about 15 miles an hour. We try to keep it a little bit lower than that. Um, and uh, um, uh, so I'm thinking about um, hooking that up, and then I would be getting it basically over the cellular network. That'd be cool, but so I would have it street safe. You'd have it like a a cell modem on the uh, on the cart. Uh, yeah, we just use a, a hotspot. Ah, okay. Hotspot. Okay. Oh, so you wouldn't you wouldn't be like connecting through USB? To, oh, well, there's nothing to connect to USB on that module, is there? Oh, I guess there is. So. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite pick that up, but um, yeah, I was planning on on just uh, connecting through a hotspot. Um, I don't do like low level microcontroller stuff so much, um, so all of our systems either have Android or uh, or something like a laptop attached to it. Cool, cool. All right, that's uh, it's fun. Friday. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, all right. So I think next in line was part okay, So we'll just pick one. I think maybe Steve, you might have been next. Oh, well, uh, I don't have a whole lot to share. I'm just happy to be here. Um, <laughs> three weeks since I joined the call, I wanted to make sure that uh, you guys didn't forget who I was. Uh, Steve, who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was out there in the country, Steve. <laughs> It's nice out here in the country. When I get tired of being inside, I just go outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I got lots of space to roam around without any people. Spoil. So, yeah. But um, no, today actually I broke out my old um, STM 32F411RE and um, I set up the, the new STM IDE. Uh, because I know Ray has been using that and saying that it's very nice. So I have been trying to get that up and running. I've resurrected some of my old ARM code um, and trying to uh, actually take some of that to make it um, into a, a base of code that I can build on uh, for all my robots. And um, I was going to beg David uh, if he was here tonight, which I'm glad he showed up, for uh, the Gerber files for his breakout board that he and Ron designed, so I can go and make a couple of those things. How about I can send you the files, but how about if I just send you a card? Oh, that would work too. Yeah, yeah. that worked too. Got, I think we made like ten of them. We put the uh, they take they need those surface mount caps, uh, and uh, I set up two of the boards that way. One of which I'm using, and the other one I had promised to Doug, but I forgot about that and gave it away. Uh, but uh, hang on, let me be sure I'm not telling a lie here. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Then I can uh, actually try and uh, hook this up as my as my baseboard. 
Uh, I do have, I don't know, can you see this? Uh, yeah, I can that. see you. Oh. Here's a box. Oh, there you Got go, yeah. Of, there's a bunch <laughs> of boards in it. There's a stack of boards in it. There's a stack of boards. And I even have the little the little surface mount caps. Oh, excellent. Uh, if you're, and I'll, I'll send those along with it. So, uh, Steve, if you just want to send me your uh, mailing address, uh, I can yeah. send you a couple of those. And, I'll do uh, that. And I can, I, I can. Uh, let's see. I think I've got the uh, the files that uh, that Ron used to design that. I think I have those tarred up. Uh, I can just send you the tar ball, and you can. That way, absorbs me of any responsibility of understanding what I send you. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Thank you very much. Hey, hey Dave, if you could, yes, if you've got extra of those caps, if you can't, you know, you said you were going to try and get some put on, but if you can't, if you can just send me the caps, I'll give it a shot. Well, we've been, um, we're supposed to go back to work on May 18th, although I just talked with my supervisor yesterday and he said, nah. So, uh, but, uh, Art Ingress, uh, I brought him to a meeting one time. I think you guys met him. The engineer I work with yeah. is the one who put those on for me. He just used a toaster oven and that uh, slaughter paste. And the whole thing was real easy and took like 10 minutes. I, after all the buildup, I was actually kind of stunned at how easy it was to do. Uh, when you put the solder paste on, uh, once it gets to temperature, the parts kind of float on the solder paste and they center themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean... It, it's really, let's see, uh, Ray, you've done some of that, haven't you? No, I haven't. Um, the uh, My extent is just hand soldering. I think it was, um, oh, God. Um, James? Yeah, James um, gave a presentation on it. He even converted a toaster oven. I don't know if you saw yeah. that or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, we just went into the kitchen at work. You're not actually using the same. You're not using the toaster oven for food after that, are you? Oops. I think everybody uses everybody uses the microwave in there. <laughs> uh, what's a what's a little lead fumes, you know? It's, yeah. It's, you can know, imagine what else you're cooking up in that kitchen, huh? Uh, <laughs> popcorn. Uh huh. Uh huh. Instant popcorn. Cool. All right, Dave, I just sent you an email with my address. I think I, I, think I just heard a pop. Hey, Steve, Dave, this is cool. It, it'll, it'll be good to see some hardware coming out. You've been you've been uh, nose deep in the work work for a while. So I'm still nose getting, deep in, in the work oh, work. That's, it's only getting worse right now. So oh boy, business is booming, and uh, all we're doing is hiring and hiring and hiring. So I'm just doing interviews left and right all day for weeks now. And then wow. as soon as they start, then I have to train them and then I have to mentor them and, and it, it's a never ending cycle. So. Oh man. Ray, did you hear that? Doing those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do tech support for Azure cloud and you think you got the, the skills to do it. Let me know. <laughs> Get you in an interview. Hey Dave, Good. on your boards, what um, did you just like? Um, kind of like a servo connector? Did you bring out VCC ground on each pin? Let let me uh, let me pull them in close view here. I don't know if this is a uh... well. Let's see. What I have here is uh, the only completed board I have is actually mounted on a robot, and it's a little hard to look at. Uh, here is an uncompleted board, and basically, what if you can if you can see what you have is the STM. Let me get my head in here. The, their ortho connector are these two things here. Yeah. So uh, this is a uh, uh, well, I'll pull the other one off. So the STM board just plugs straight into that. And then these connectors here on either side have uh, a ground bus, a power bus, and then two pins from the ortho connector. And which two they are is sort of dependent on my particular 
see, I've got, this was the first board I made. Let's see. Can you see that? This one is a, was hand wired and, uh, but it'll give you an idea here if I pull this apart. There we go. So board itself, uh, looks like that with all the parts on it. And there's a five volt and a 3.3 volt, uh, power bus. And then you can see the, the, uh, or maybe you can't see, uh, the pins on either side. As I say, the outer one's ground, the middle one's power. And then you have, uh, say, PA1 and PA0 or whatever. They're actually grouped by, by function. Uh, mm. So, uh, as I mentioned before, often when you're actually using one of these boards to hook up uh, peripheral devices, uh, you end up needing pins in pairs, uh, A and B channel on an encoder, or transmit and receive for a serial port, or whatever. Uh, and you always need power and ground. So uh, it doesn't uh, take, you know, there's like only one power and ground pin on the STM board itself. And it doesn't use that. It uses this external uh, supply. And uh, for the, uh, <clears throat> so that you don't have the, the servos on the same uh, power bus that you have the, the CPU, you guys who are experienced have probably seen how those servos can suck so much current, they'll brown out your CPU mm -hmm. if they're on the same bus. Yeah. Servos, so sharp uh, By the same token, everything has a 5-volt bus except uh, the things I have configured as A to D channels, uh, and that, because the A to D converter on that is a 3.3 volt device, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to hang a potentiometer or a photo cell or something like that, it's convenient that the power be 3.3 volts also. So, uh, so there's a separate. Well, you can't really see it here, but there's a separate 3.3 volt bus just for the uh, the A to D channels, mm -hmm. and I have I can't remember four or eight. Uh, A to G channels. I can't remember how those are configured. Yeah. Hmm. Ron also designed because Ron is good that way. He also designed this handy little prototyping space here, uh, which is in that space between the two boards, uh, and it also has a five volt and a three point three volt bus. So nice. if you needed to add some something there, some kind of uh, uh, data massaging or whatever. Yeah, is it? Pretty much specific for the 411, or will it? Do you know if it'll work for other boards, the 407, or? It'll well, work for any 64 pin one. It, yeah, oh, it, yeah, it works for the uh, the uh, 401, or is that the 403? It works for several of those that have the same form factor and have that same ortho connector. Uh, oh, okay. I was just looking at the. Uh, the STM, the Nucleo 144 board, those long skinny boards. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm kind of envious because if they have so many I/O pins that I would like to be able to use that these 411 boards don't have, but they won't work on my nifty breakout boards. Uh, yeah. So we either have to make new breakout boards, or I've got to figure out how to use the ones I have. Do you have an extra one? An extra breakout board? Yeah. Yeah, you want one? Yeah, sure. Send me your uh, send me your address. So I got one. I'm going to send. Let's see, Doug has one. He needs capacitors. And um, Steve would like a board and some caps, right, Steve? That's right. Yes, thank you. And the girl refiner. Ray, you would also like. Uh, yes, yes. The the real life documentation. That's right. This is this is actually Rev two. Uh, Rev, Rev one we had made by the purple boards, uh, by uh, what's that place? Oshkosh. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Could be. And, Oshpark. Uh, and these, yeah, exactly. Oshpark. Thank you. Oshkosh. The new ones are green, and I can't remember who made them. Well, they still they say Rev. They, they still say Rev one, right? <clears throat> these are. We should say Rev two. I can't read. Can anybody see that? Up a little uh, higher. Let me, let me get some bright light. Hang on. <laughs> well, it says down at the bottom. It says nuclear 
Nucleo what? bottom row. You're right. You're right. It says Rev 1. Well, these are the Rev 2 boards. <laughs> they're labeled Rev 1, just to make that clear. And they're green, right? They're green, yeah. Right. And that's well, that the one means, you have. That just means Rev 3 should be red or something. Exactly. We're color coded. Yeah. Okay, well, cool. Um, well, Carl, that, that actually leads me to some questions I have. Can I jump in here and get, get out of line? I was going to say, you're, we're actually at, at your point in line. I think you're the, uh, the last person who hasn't had an official squat, squat to speak, so jump right in. Well, it's no fun if I don't get to cut in line. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll try and say something. Just stomp all over me, right? Because, uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, um, about, uh, what is this? This is May. Uh, long, last last fall somewhere, um, about a year and a half ago, I started uh, doing the port of the code that I've been running uh, on that RCAT robot, which is uh, on the Mini Robo Mine 68332. Hmm. And I decided that I wanted to port that uh, to this STM uh, 411 board and uh, learn, learn the ARM world. And so I started basically doing what Steve was describing. And, and it's just moving my libraries and so forth. Uh, and that's, that's basically complete now. Uh, I, don't, I don't have all the functionality that I, I have all the functionality and more than I started with, but not all that I had planned on. Uh, in particular, I can't, at this point, I can't zero in on a can, uh, rotate around, turn on the blower, leaf blower, and blow it through the goal, uh, which was my goal. Uh, I can still drive around and sweep the whole course with the leaf blower and blow all the cans off. But I was told that uh, after I did that successfully the first time, that the rules were changed so that that's now illegal. That's so the there is a there is a truism about all contests, not just robot contests, and that is that the people who design the rules hate innovation. <laughs> They've already decided how you should solve the problem. Well, we love innovation. All, and if you solve it in some clever way, that's called cheating. No, no, we love innovation. <laughs> You're interpreting that that uh, wrongly. See, once you solve it one way, now we're going to make you solve it a different way each each well, time. Well, Doug had encouraged me. He said we want somebody that can actually knock those cans through the goal. And I actually experimented for quite a while to see if I could whack them, like with a, a hockey stick or a or a golf club. Uh, I built a uh, a vortex cannon to see if I could puff them uh, through the goal. And, uh, nice. <laughs> it, but it turned out that the leaf blower was just the best way to do it. Uh, it's the easiest way to do it. And uh, if any of you guys uh, remember the last contest I ran that in, what I actually did was I, I would uh, rotate around and use the sonar and just locate where all the cans were, kind of where the mass of the cans were. And then I would just rotate outwards and just sweep them toward the goal, just mm -hmm. do a sweeping I found out experimentally that, that when I did that, a bunch of them ended up down in the corners. They wouldn't actually go through the goal. They got stuck in the corner. So then I added a behavior that drove down into the corners and swept out the corners. And, swept <laughs> into the corners. and I pretty much could get every can every time. I think the rule change that bit me was the one that said you could only have one can go through the goal at a time. And uh, uh, since I was basically making them you, almost all go through the goal. Yeah, you can't... Con you can't control more than one can at a time. That was the one. I think, but I was I hoping think that I was uh, hoping Kareem was going to go to a uh, to the launcher. You know, he when his first robot, the first contest we had down at ooh, what was it, Perot? Yeah. Kareem had had a sweeper and a launcher, but I guess he wasn't quite it wasn't quite mature enough yet. And but then they never saw it again, Kareem. I was hoping that you would just sit there and shoot them through the gold. Kathum, uh, um, Yeah, uh, we had a nice little catapult launcher that would uh, grab. Uh, yeah, it would grab the can. We were able to find the cans pretty well. Um, the it was just one of those things. It was like in between our regular competitions, and we found a little time to work on that, and then 
you know, and then we're off on a different schedule again. So we just didn't complete it. Yeah. yeah. Is, we could have had a, the, could have had a real uh, shootout. Ships where they actually shoot um, like quarter inch, I don't know, maybe bigger than that, small ball bearings at each other and sink ships. There's, yeah, that's the uh, yeah. RC warship combat. Yeah. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a group in Dallas that does that. In, instead of you know firing actual ball bearings, I wonder if you could they use like an accumulator and a I guess a quick acting gate valve to discharge the accumulator, um, and it's they're apparently powered by CO2 uh, cylinders that you could use in like um, uh, paint guns. Yeah. Um, anyway, so you get enough of a blast. I wonder if that could be applied to, you know, just instead of like a vortex cannon, a, you know, stick the, the the opening of the orifice of that, you know, that gate valve right next to the can and just try to blow it into a goal. I wonder if it would have enough force. Well, I think I have all the pieces of it working. I can find a can. I can go to the can. I don't have a gripper, but I can uh, basically go to it with a... Uh, Whoa. Uh, just a fixed uh, V in the front. So go toward the can and then rotate toward the goal. And then the next step is you got to see if anything else is between you and the goal. Uh, and if there is, you got to push yourself sideways one way or the other. So you get a clear shot. And then uh, back away from the can just about two inches and turn on the leaf blower and uh, <laughs> let the leaf blower run for about half a second and then start wiggling it back and forth. Uh, so that it, it kind of, if you, basically the higher velocity air uh, is lower pressure. So there's a pressure differential between the high velocity air and the lower velocity air, and it kind of traps the can inside that stream. Uh, yeah. And if you're pointed at the goal, it ought to go through the goal. I don't know if this piece is working. However, uh, I've actually gotten to the point where I started working on a different set of problems, uh, and I showed a little bit of this to Carl at one time, of uh, of using the uh, the environment that I'm in in order to correct the drift in uh, odometry, and basically uh, with that robot, uh, the bet is that you're inside a building, and buildings have corners that are orthogonal to the space that you're in, and so you can use those as fiduciary points where you go and uh, basically square up on the two walls in the corner and use that to correct both your theta drift and your X and Y drift. And uh, I had that working in my office back in the day when I could go to my office. Uh, you know, you close the door, nobody really knows what you're doing in there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I could, uh, basically I would set it up so that the robot had some other task, uh, like a wall following or, or well, almost anything. Uh, and then I set off a timer, and the timer would go off, let's say, every five minutes. And when the timer went off, the robot would seek back to uh, the closest fiduciary point, the point where it had been told there was a corner. And it would uh, measure, square up on the on the corner and measure its uh, X and Y distance. And then using that information, it would correct the theta, correct its location, and even correct the drift in the gyroscope. Uh, if the drift was large enough, and I had a, a come up with a really neat algorithm for squaring up on the on the wall. Uh, it's really smart about knowing that the wall is really flat and that you're really normal to it, so that it doesn't get caught on things that are not flat or uh, corners or or whatever. And uh, and that is, uh, I probably could do a presentation of that, but I need to get back into my office and shoot some video or something like that. I think I showed you. I got. I've been 30 years in SMU, and uh, they gave me a little glass plaque and uh, an award. And I know when I got it, I, my thought was, 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> but, so uh, Steve had inspired me, so uh, they asked me what I would like as a gift, and they gave me a catalog. And uh, one of the things in the catalog was this GoPro with a whole bunch of uh, accessories. Nice. Uh, so I said, give me one of those. And I've been having oh I've been having a great time with it. It's so cool. It is so yeah. cool. <laughs> so uh, 
I get back up there and the, and shoot some video in the office and I can I can demo these things. So I haven't really done anything for the now going on eight weeks that I've been uh, quarantined at home. Uh, <laughs> uh, and but I've been thinking about all these things. So a couple of days ago, uh, I started looking at the JBot, the outdoor robot, which also has a uh, mini RoboMind sixty eight three thirty two. And uh, thinking that maybe what I ought to do is start thinking about converting that to the arm uh, also, which I'd like to do. So I sat down uh, two days ago and I started making a list of all the I.O. and everything that's required. And I realized I ran into a showstopper. And that is that that STM32 uh, Nucleo F11 has three serial ports. Uh, you are one, two, and six, uh, and that's it. And I need five. Mm. So uh, I've been thinking here the last two days. I've been doing a lot of research, trying to figure out uh, how I can come up with two more serial ports. And basically what I've decided is probably the right way to do it, or a way to do it. Let me rephrase that. The way I'm thinking about doing it now is uh, – that I will add a second processor, probably a Teensy, and uh, let the Teensy talk to two of those uh, serial ports and have it communicate SPI with the uh, <clears throat> with the uh, STM32, with the Nucleo board. Uh, however, while I was hunting around, I also looked at that uh, Nucleo 144 board, the long skinny one, and, and it has like six UARTs on it. Uh, so, and I would really always rather, uh, I know this is not a popular view, <laughs> but uh, I think when you start having multiple processors talking to each other, you introduce an exponentially more difficult problem uh, sure. because, because of the communications channel and you really can't get to things that, that you might like to get to that you didn't think of in advance. Uh, that's in the other processor. If it's all in one big memory space, then any task can get to uh, request information from any other task. Uh, and so, but as I say, that would require me designing some new breakout boards and there's just not an easy way to do this. Doggone it. <laughs> hey, is there uh, the equivalent of soft serial? Have you found a library in? Well, I found three of them. They were all for sale. Uh, oh. uh, I didn't find any uh, uh, open source ones, uh, yeah. but that was, you know, that was my immediate thought, especially since a couple of these uh, are, are low baud rate devices, of, you know, 96K or, or 48K yeah. uh, that would be suitable to do in software. And that, yeah, uh, uh, if mm -hmm. anybody has a nifty ARM software UART, I see Steve is looking one up right now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, send me the link. I, I spent a couple of days searching for things like that. Uh, but I, no, I, didn't find I don't know of any. How, did, how there, are you going to do the uh, SPI between the STM and the Teensy? Well, the uh, <clears throat> the cube library, the STM32 cube library, uh, came with an SPI uh, driver. And uh, there's hardware... Uh, built into that board uh, to do the SPI interface. Which which side would be the master? The, I would make the, the Nucleo the master and the Teensy the slave. But, but do you have a library then for the Teensy side for it to be a slave? Uh, yes. And it, it would be basically running the same software. I've got, you know, I run my little RTOS uh, multitasking and that runs fine on the Teensy. Uh, <clears throat> The, you know, I ported that over to the Arduino mostly because you guys wanted it, but it's really miserable on the Arduino. It doesn't, the Arduino doesn't have enough horsepower to do it. Uh, but the ARM, you know, it's just like a handful of instructions. Uh, it's, it's really nice from there. So I'd probably be running the same code on both ends, and the Teensy would be running as the slave, and the, the uh, mean, Nucleo is the master. I mean, do you have a slave uh, library, SPI slave library that runs on a Teensy? Well, uh, my understanding, looking through the code they have, is really you just uh, the difference between the master and the slave is that the master sends the clock and it asserts the the uh, uh, chip select, 
and the, uh, the, there's a bit in the the uh, in the hardware that you set that tells it whether it's a master or a slave. All right. So then, and you just have to take care of the synchronization tasks then, because the communication be asynchronous between processor loops, right? My understanding, and again, I haven't actually implemented this. I've just read through the code. Uh, it looks like the way the SPI works is that uh, when the master sends a byte, uh, the slave receives that byte and simultaneously sends a byte. So every transfer is a two-way transfer. Yeah, that, that part is synchronous, right? Because that's, that's what I'm relying on. But then the part I realized quickly was that if I have a loop running on, in my case, it's Raspberry Pi, and yours, it's the, your case is the Nucleo. And then on, on the slave side, in your case, it's the Teensy. On my side, it's an Arduino Mega. Well, the Raspberry Pi is running at its loop rate. The Mega is running at its loop rate. So even though the, the bytes are moved across in a serial fashion, they still arrive asynchronously between processor execution loops. So you have to be careful from what I the, like, and that's why I have this library that I wrote for this on, on the pair I mentioned, that that uh, when the bytes come in asynchronous to the mega, the slave side execution loop, that it's able to gather all the bytes up as a coherent package. So they're all in sync together and then expose them to the outer loop, which is at whatever phase it happens to be at. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Do you want to, you want to, send that code along it's on github oh, okay yeah uh, the, way I, the way i had imagined doing this would be uh, uh basically that i would set it up to emulate sort of like dual ported memory but uh, both ends would have a block a read block and a write block and those blocks would be uh, kept uh, coherent uh, the spi interface and then the outer loops on either end would just read those blocks so if i want to write something to a UART in the Teensy, I just write into the block on my end and uh, and go away. If I want to read something from one of the UARTs on the Teensy, I read from the read block on my end, and it gives yeah. me whatever the most current uh, data is from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I bet, I, th I think you've already got it cracked in that way. I, yeah. I doubt that my code could add any... Uh, <laughs> any oh, shit, you've got yours working. I'm just waving my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you wave your hands and it works. I don't. I can't get away with that. <laughs> I'm not that confident. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I don't have it set up where I'd show you again, but I'll I can pull it up next time we're on. And uh, at some point, I was gonna. I mean, I got oscilloscope stuff. I'm I'm really pleased. It's it's almost prime time now for me. Yep. Well, this this is where I am. So I'm thinking very seriously that I would like to. Actually, now that I that I've got the RCAT robot uh, code moved over, uh, I'm running on the ARM. That's ninety percent of what I needed uh, for JBot. Uh, you know, I'm, all the hard problems I've actually solved, and most of the things will transfer directly. Uh, but, but there are a handful of things, like the fact that I need five UARTs and I've only got three, uh, yeah. that uh, that are yeah. just have brought me to a screeching halt, and I need to. Think about how I want to solve that. Hey, David, uh, did you? Can you? I put something out in chat you might be interested in. There's a there's a proto board for one of those 144s. Uh, I I didn't go into great detail, and they do have a picture on it. It might be maybe not perfect, but it might have, be of some use. You know. I see. That's a, a what they called a shield. Yeah. But I'm just saying something that might be of use. Uh, how many tasks can you put on on your arm? Now, I know it's limited by memory, but I mean, I believe on the Mega you could do about ten or so. Uh, how many? How many do you can you put on uh, an arm? How many tasks do you have rolling? Oh, I I've never uh, I've never run out. I think I I have a. Uh... <clears throat> If I do some uh, memory allocation on startup, I think that I uh, lay aside uh, room for 32 slots. Uh, 32. But that's just that's an arbitrary number. I think that the uh, JBot runs about uh, 20, and gotcha. the RCAT runs on the same order. Gotcha. 
sometimes, you know, there are certain tasks that uh, might uh, fork off other tasks that just run for a short amount of time and then die. So it's not necessarily a fixed number. I did notice, uh, I think it was Doug had written that uh, one of the uh, stumbling blocks with the DPRG group robot that made it so hard for anybody to actually make anything useful. And he set out, I think, three things that he thought were uh, difficulties. And number one on the list was David Anderson's software. <laughs> oh. Oh. No, I, I actually, I actually liked that. Uh, what is it? The tasking thing. I can't remember what you've named it. It was on K, right? Element. Element. Lightweight multitasking executive. Yeah, that. Uh, was... But as I say, it, it really uh, on the Arduino, it's it's a kludgy thing. Uh, on the on the ARM, it's a thing of beauty because the ARM hardware does almost all of it for you. All the task switching and everything is almost built into the to the instruction set. So it's really trivial to do on the arm. I must say, now that I've been working with that arm for, I guess, three years now, with that instruction set, and I've written a bunch of assembly, and I'm, I've really got to know the thing. I love that processor, really. I mean, it's like the HC-6811. It's my love affair back in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Love affair with a turbo mode processor. <laughs> much much faster all right yeah, i think i showed i showed you guys at one of the meetings i had made some some graphs some gnu plots uh murray for uh to watch all the tasks that were running so that uh -huh. i could see who was eating up the most time uh and uh so i just ported all that stuff over to the arm and uh the smallest uh, uh quanta uh, on that is a uh, I believe was uh, 10 microseconds. And basically all the tasks just showed up as a single blip. <laughs> None of them used more than 10 microseconds. So wow. that diagnostic tool was actually quite colorful, but totally useless. It, <laughs> <tell me anything. laughs> uh, it did tell me, uh, I would say, uh, calculate how much uh, CPU time there is. And it would come back and say, you have 99.3% idle CPU time. And that's with everything running and the robot doing everything it wants to do. Uh, so, you know, if you wanted to, like, run Linux in the background or something, you, you've got plenty of time <laughs> to do it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that kind of boring thing you don't really need to do, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, Dave, what, what did you say it could do? Um, cycle through, I guess, like 8,000 tasks a second or something? Was that well, it depends on... It depends on how big the what I what I did was it's just quick and dirty. Is that uh, one of the tasks which I call the idle task, and all it does is bump a timer, bump a counter. So every time around the whole loop, everybody that wants to run around that loop, and of course everybody doesn't want to run every time around. But when you get all around the loop, that that, that timer gets dinked, and then once a second I would reset that timer by a foreground task. I'd reset it to zero. So by looking at that number, I can tell how many times I go around the loop per second on average. And uh, on the uh, on the uh, 68332, uh, when everything was really bogged down and I'm running everything, uh, that would be on the order of a kilohertz. Uh, and on the uh, arm, that's on the order of 220 kilohertz. Oh, it's that much difference. Wow. Wow. I don't know where the APA yeah, comes from, but it must have been number I picked from somewhere. Okay. So uh, we have stalled long enough. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to present something for you here, Dave, uh, at risk of boring people who've already seen it. Um, so basically, I don't have it zoomed very well, I think. Or do I? Let's see. There we go. Okay. So uh, let me share my screen. Coming right up. I'll share this one. Okay, where is that? Uh, almost Kareem? ready. Kareem, was that from you? Was that cat from you? 
look like it. Okay. Um, present oh, gas. Uh, entire screen almost ready. Here we go. Okay. So, can you guys see my screen now? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So the basic idea here is that this is uh, this is the same old robot I've been working with, Club Car Donkey Bot. Down below is the 2016 Club Robot Base, and then up above is uh, Donkey Car Raspberry Pi. So Arduino Omega, Raspberry Pi, and then one of these this tangled web of wires is a spy interface. So the Raspberry Pi itself is a master, and then what the scope is showing now is let's see that sh that should be okay what the scope is showing is that on the bottom is the uh the time the main loop on the raspberry i mean on the on the arduino mega is running so it's like whatever that is uh five or five or eight microsecond milliseconds on the bottom every now and then it's a little wider because once a second i write more junk to the console log and on the top is uh, on the top is the uh, spy master. So the Raspberry Pi is deciding to send a burst of. Uh, I have uh, the way I wrote this, Dave. It has, I think, uh, it's a 19 byte packet with 16 bytes of payload. So ever at every whatever rate that is, it'll exchange uh, 16 bytes of payload in each direction at the same time synchronously. Do the, uh, Carl, can I interrupt? Do those other three bytes uh, tell the receiving end what kind of packet it is and what to do with it? No. Uh, the first two are for uh, initialization and then the, and then framing, and then the last one is just a frame, kind of. So they, they say, hey, there's a burst about to start, and then the last one is, okay, the burst is over, and it's a kind of a crude way that I use to know whether the burst was exchanged correctly or not. So then the way that the, the way that I have it defined, I have four, well, you can see in the code, I have four individual bytes. And I have in my in my framework, it's basically a command byte, uh, forward throttle. No, there's a turn velocity, forward throttle, and sideways throttle. So I can handle any degree of motion in a two two-dimensional plane. And then I have three uh Word uh, four byte wide, uh, you know, however packets for whatever data I want to send or break them up or not. So it's an arbitrary thing, and I should have done it as an even number. So I need to extend it so it's uh, twenty bytes. But this is good enough for now. But you can see every now and then that, like on the top, the uh, you see how the bursts are not consistent; they're spread around, and that's because in the donkey car code. Other it, the donkey car code has something like LMX, so it it lets you set up a bunch of tasks and they run whenever they want to, uh, and and now and then they stomp on each other and whenever that happens it screws up my spy protocol, so I had a window where I allowed up to thirty milliseconds. More than that, I said it was taking too long. It's a bad transfer, but because the donkey car I had to widen that to about fifty milliseconds. And I found that if I widen my window to allow a 50 byte window, a 50 millisecond window, and then if I slow down the donkey car execution loop from 20 hertz to about 15, then it doesn't drop that many packets at all. I think it's quite usable. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it this way for now instead of the next level to take this would be to write like a Linux driver for spy. And I don't wanna do that right now. A kernel, a kernel level driver, right? Done plenty of that. So, uh, so I'm not going to do that. But this at least is running, and I pasted the link in the chat window. And there's, uh, you know, it's not the prettiest code, but it's not the worst either. So, uh, if it's of any value, just feel free to have at it. And uh, but it's in, uh, remember, it's in Git repo land, and I forget how much I've merged in the master branch. So there might be goodness hiding in a branch that's not visible. So anyhow, I have to talk you through if you get stuck on Git. Okay, it's this uh, It's this link that says Mega SPI? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank, you. thank you, Carl. 
Thank you. Yeah, sure. So the way, it, the way it works, let me, um, I can move this out of the way. At some point, I, I'd like to do it. I think it'd make it a decent talk for the club, but I don't think I'm ready to do it just yet. But as Git repos go, just remember that you can, um, well, anyhow, that's a whole other talk by itself. But there's minimal documentation here, which is um, basically a level, a level adapter. You, you and Ron Grant might use proper schematics uh, and talk about your 30 year badge at SMU. So this is the way I, the way I do it. That looks good to me. You know, um, so that works. Uh, and then the, the slave side is here and the master side is here. And uh, it really wants better documentation, but it pretty much runs. So there you go. Great. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. That's that's my ad hoc presentation du jour. Thankfully, it still works. All right. So uh, I think we've gone around the table. Uh, and if there's nothing else anyone else had to present tonight, I wanted to ask about this coming Saturday. Ooh, yeah. This would be the normal time for our monthly club meeting. I put a call out for any presentation ideas. I don't think I saw any responses. Uh, if anybody had any ideas or requests, that'd be great. Crickets. Yeah, crickets. <laughs> so there's just one thing being the, uh, the crazy pres pre uh, president of the day that I am. Uh, you know, I think we've pretty much run ourselves dry in these weekly meetings. Thankfully, everybody's still having some value to add, but uh, I think we're slowing down a little bit. So the one thing I can offer, if there was enough interest, is that I'm happy to give my uh, semi-robot related search engine presentation. So I'm happy to walk through and describe how the how the Google robots are experimenting on us and what happens when you you search for something into the Google search bar. And if you want to see how that kind of works and how webmasters control it, I'm happy to do it. But otherwise, I'm happy to go work on my spy interface and get the damn thing working. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, is there enough interest to actually call that and do it this Saturday? Sure. I would say yes to because baseball right now. Yeah, I don't have anything to show or talk about. Okay. So. And I think Steve has already seen it, but he's given the double thumbs up. That's better than the other two finger make a uh, gesture. So <laughs> we're going to go with that one. Okay, I will post a meetup out uh, hopefully tomorrow sometime. we got some rookie work stuff to do, but I'll post that out. And uh, if you guys are good with 1 o'clock Dallas time, that'll that'll save Murray from getting up at, before the, the sun if he's interested. Are you Five interested, Murray? 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Carl, I, I think it, it's also good to uh, incorporate some show and tell because uh, – uh, the more people are likely to show up to the monthly meeting than come to these Tuesday night meetings, and there might be people who have uh, some progress they've made on or, or want to talk about okay. it. So it just have a chance to uh, do like you do here, go down the list and ask each person if they have something they want to do, show and tell, or ask questions. Uh, that that's good. That that's a good thing, a good use of that meeting time. Yeah. Cool. I think I think that whole that is a process that's been working out for us pretty well here. It seems like we're having interaction we wouldn't normally have just um, at the makerspace. So when you say out there, by I would say include that into that too. Yeah, we'll do. Okay. I'll uh, I'll I'll send that around. Hey Clay, did you see my note about the CS lenses at Tanner's? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, yes, I saw that. However, I saw it right after I got back from Tanner's. But uh... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. You might be able to catch them over at uh, BG Micro. I don't know if, that's, if that stuff's going over there. But I, I looked online. Um, they had one that had, um, it looked like it was a four-pin electrical connector. I'm assuming... Uh, focus and zoom 
Um, it's pretty good size. I don't know, uh, maybe three inches across for the optics. So much bigger than, you know, just a regular CS sized lens. Um, he had like, you know, it was, like I said, $5 for a, a smaller one, $10 for a larger one, and then 15 for the one that had, you know, it was motorized. So, um, but, um, uh, I, I was thinking, yeah, I, sh I should have just probably bought the motorized one for 15 bucks, and then, you know, it, it, if I couldn't use it or something, it'd be a, you know, at least a few minutes of entertainment or something for 15 bucks. Yeah, I probably have some CS lenses in a box somewhere, but uh, I'm mostly excited about get the new Raspberry Pi camera. I don't, nobody has them in stock yet, but yeah, that looks really nice. Yeah. Anyway. I will say I'm, I'm already going through uh, Tanner withdrawals when I was drawing up uh, my notes for doing this uh, port of the software on JBot. I made a note uh, to talk to the XB controller from the USB and I have to do a conversion and I might need a Max 232 uh, level shifter. And I looked in my box and no, I don't have one among my chips, but I can just drop by Tanner's and oh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. How are you guys going to solve those problems? I know there's a. Is it? A, what's the place up there on Trinity Mills we were talking about? A Tex. Oh, Altex. 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 Yeah. Altex. Altex. Yeah. They have a lot of. They have a lot of parts like that. You mentioned BG Micro. Um, or, I'm using or, Amazon. You guys should move to New Amazon. Zealand. Right here, ha ha ha. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if you guys, if you guys remember when ten, when we first heard the rumors that Tenors was going out of business about a year ago, and I published online, I posted uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, Lama Sabax, and I, just to see what uh, erudite um, robot builders were among us, and Kareem immediately replied back. Uh, Thus spake us Amazon, thou shalt have no other sources before me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's where we are. So, Mary, you have to do everything by mail order, isn't that right? You can't drop by Tanner's and pick up a Pittman motor? No, what's really sad is that we had, when I first moved here in 2006, um, there was an electronics store that was selling kind of everything, and then they kind of did the Radio Shack thing. They started making more and more decisions to get rid of parts, and they ended up becoming just a consumer electronics store, and then they went out of business. And so now, in all of New Zealand, there's only one store that sells electronic parts, and if they go under during this pandemic thing, that's it. We'll be mail order only. So yeah, it's kind of it's it's getting to the point where we're gonna have to do mail order. So how many miles is that? You're calling Tesla's, you know, you can go two hundred miles or so to get to a place. So I imagine well, there's I, I, I live a half an hour from a relatively big city, Wellington, and you know, Auckland is sort of like Los Angeles. It's just a big spread out suburb. But um in terms of where things are, most stuff is on the North Island, and there's not that many businesses. So like, like, like I said, there's one company called JCAR, and they've got offices in Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch. And they sell, actually, like in 1979, I worked at, what was the name of that store in Sacramento? Um, it was an electronics store. It was my first job was at an electronics store with parts, you know, doing inventory. And that kind of thing doesn't really exist. But JCAR in New Zealand actually has quite a lot of parts. They've got ICs and pots and stuff like that you can get almost anything but if they go under now we're dead you know that'll be it yeah yeah um adafruit used to have a list of um you know tanner like places um it, there's a, a lot of them are still in business um hmm. um alltronics all electronics out of, out of california um mpg you know mpja Marlon P. Jones and Associates. Uh, dot com, um, Electronics Gold Mine. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, Herbach and Radiman. There's, there's still several that are out there that have mm -hmm. you know similar kinds of stuff that uh, um, Tanner's used to carry. So, um, but hey, hey guys. 
Doug has uh, Doug has put a reminder in chat uh, that uh, we had more sponsors than Tanners. So, for example, Mauser, and they are also local to us. Ah. Fantastic supplier, great options, good delivery, and we ought to show them the love as much as we can. Now you can pick up too if you want. All right. So, you know, one, one of the wonderful things about Tanners was that I would have a problem. And I would go in there without a good idea of how I was going to solve that problem and just walk around, walk up and down the aisles and look at stuff. And then I go, oh, look at this gadget. You know, well, I could just mill the end of that off and it would do exactly what I want. You know, uh, whatever this thing is uh, that Jimmy Tanners has put 25 cents on, you know, uh, so that it was part of my, for, for decades, part of my problem solving uh, methodology. Yeah. You know? Well, that is the argument for physical bookstores, of course. Yeah, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yeah. I have a technical question for you guys since we're all here. Um, as you may know, I'm using these big Makita power supply, 18 to 20 volt batteries for my robot, and I have been trying to find a 5 volt supply, and there was a USB adapter that didn't work it blew out so I've bought some of these little polo Lu ones this is a 2.5 amp 5 volt and I've got the 5 amp one on my robot the problem I have is they don't put up 5 volts they put up 4.75 4.8 volts how do I get a good 5 volt supply for the robot any ideas can I answer this yeah uh, I like to use what the the uh, radio control airplane and car guys call a battery eliminator circuit. <clears throat> In the old days, they had a separate battery for their motor and a separate one for the electronics. So they, what they call a DC DC converter, they right. call a battery, a BEC, and they can be had reasonably priced and they're really robust. Uh, I think, let's see, I've got one hanging on the shelf right here. Let me pick it up. There, one of the reasons it's good for mm, it's good for robot stuff is because they're the stuff is really robust because they just beat the crap out of it in, in there. So this is one. Uh, I run this off a 24 volt pack uh, on one side, and it gives me a five volts at 10 amps on the other side. 10 amps, really, okay. Yeah, really wow. solid. Big big cap sitting up, sitting there on the end. I don't know if you can. Okay, because I, I probably oh, yeah. need at least two or three amps, I think. Probably more than... Well, you can get... A, go to... A, is it Crystal? Because hmm. I thought the, about the just... Magic, the magic word they use is they call it a BEC, a battery alarm, eliminator circuit. Go to okay. any like Hobby King or any of those uh, radio control guys and they'll, they'll have all kinds of them. And they have a good 5-volt output, eh? Yeah, it's nice and secure, and these are set up because uh, you can get them that are uh, programmable. Uh, a lot wow. of times, like on the big robots, they want to run their servos at 7 volts, so they're just a little snappier uh, than right. at 5 volts. So you can actually go in uh, on one side of the thing. You can actually hook up to it and program uh, okay. the actual voltage, and then it, they're just rock solid. Well, cause I think the Pi actually likes a little more than 5. It's like 5.1 is where they're ideal at. For a three, that's true. Yeah. That's absolutely. Oh. Are you seeing? Uh, are you using a three? Plus? Yeah, three E plus. Yeah. Yeah. Are you seeing what is it? Low low voltage pop up on your. Yeah, all the time. Yep. Yeah. It'll run at four point eight, but it's not happy. No, it has to be five point one for three. Yeah, and so I thought about, like these don't even run at five. I mean, they're running at five at four point seven five or four point eight. So you yeah. Might you might check with Polo. There's probably a resistor on there that you can change. Not on, on these? Well, they're all surface mount, so it'd be kind of hard. Mm. Is there, uh, is there uh, a, a, a diode, a drop that keeps you from plugging it in backwards or anything like that? Well, probably. I mean, it's it's not, I mean, they're, it's, it's, they're, it's working fine. And I, like I have, this is the 2.5 amp one. And I've got the 5 amp one. I thought it might make a difference, but no, they put up 4.8 volts for some reason. I don't, I don't understand why. They're, they're listed as a 5 volt device. I put a link in to a little switching supply, a DC-DC converter. 
okay. um, that I've used successfully in the past. It's from Mauser, 10 bucks, and it'll handle up to 10 amps, and you can program the output from, I think, four and a half volts on up to six volts or something like that. That's exactly what I want. One with a little, because I've got a bench to power supply that I bought at JCAR locally in Sac uh, Wellington, and it's bench to 14 amp bench supply with a little potentiometer, and I dialed it right up to 5.1, and that's exactly what I need is something with a pot on it. Yeah, I don't know if this has a pot. I think you have to use a resistor. Oh, that's um, fine. Yep. To, to get it. Yeah, I have yeah. one. Um, I was going to run downstairs and get it. It's a little tiny one, but it has a trimmer capacitor right. yeah. uh, resistor on it and uh i, I love that one um and right. it, it was on a card at tanner's one of those kit ones but uh it does have a little trimmer those regulators basically have a a, a control input so right and most of the ones i found have been like around one amp or something like that but i think that my robot's around two to 2.5 amps is what it seems to be running it right now yeah, this this one on this board is like 1.8 amps, and it's um, uh, it's got a pot on it, so you can adjust it. Um, right. Got it from Banggood. Well, um, the one that Steve posted is 10 amps. That would be plenty. Yeah, um, they they make them with you know higher current draw. Same thing with Palulu, I think. Um, well, I don't know. I've never looked at Palulu for an adjustable one. They're all. I, I, yeah, they always use their little fixed ones like that. So Murray, send them an email or, or, or go on their forum and tell them that you that you what you're trying to do with it. And you might be surprised. They might have a solution for you because Bowler is a pretty good company. Yeah, and, and they, they're desperate for business. I know they've been pleading with people to buy stuff from them because they're they're having trouble, I think. Yeah. But yeah. But I was a bit I mean, I think I actually did send post into their form or, and nothing happened big you know there are probably not too many people working there right now but but i was surprised that this says it's a five volt device and you know it looks pretty sophisticated and yet it doesn't put out five volts and i and i have two of them a 2.5 and a five amp model and they both do the same thing yeah hmm. so the problem with that thing that i posted that only takes input voltage up to i think 14 volts max oh. normally it wants 12. yeah and uh, i've got a oh yeah 14 max yeah, so the battery eliminator circuit is probably a better choice. Okay. I like those two. I mean, from the RC world, yeah, that's, that's how they get their logic level down to five. If I've okay. got a servo on mine, I always use those little little fly uh, fly wing ones. They're nicely packaged. They're they're RC, like David mentioned, and they're good for two amps. Okay. Yeah, I have a bunch of those too, Carl. Yeah, yeah this. But this strip has a. a this strip came in a strip of ten for about eight dollars. Yeah. And each one is good for three amps without a heat sink, and oh. it's variable. You just turn a pot on there, a trim pot, and uh, and you can set the voltage wherever you want. So on a smaller one that I have, I I take a well, it, it has a wide input voltage range it accepts, and I set the output to six volts for the motors, and it's been fine. But what's the really max? What's the max voltage on that? I'd have to pull up the sheet. It's called a DSN Mini 360. At least that's the labeling on it. DSN dash Mini. Oh yeah, I found it. Solar Robotics. Uh, up to 23 volts, so that would work. Because my battery says it's 18, but it's actually around 20 volts. And that's only $3.65? Yeah. Okay. All right. That'll work. It does pretty good without a without um, a heat sink. If you're careful Although, about the dissipation that it can it can support. Although that says it's a 1.8 amp continuous rated three amp surge, and this robot yeah. is definitely over two amps right now. Yeah. So I mean, at three bucks a piece, you get a few of them and just split up your power distribution. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, why not? Or I can dig around, but I haven't been looking for these. But that's a good place to look. Then I'll look for buck converters because, yeah, yeah if, you out, if you go out to the Chinese sites like uh, Bang Good, whatnot, you can you they have a, they go you can go all the way up to ten amps. Okay, cool. A little large, but 
So to get five amps, and it, and since it's Chinese, you always got to make sure you got to degrade it, you know, by half usually. Otherwise, look look at what you know. Look at the spec and see what yeah. they say. Yeah. And if you find the same chip on po uh, Pololo, for yeah. example, and the Pololo guy is saying he can get you know two amps out of it or three amps, and the other guy is saying he can get ten amps. Go with the polo loose for yeah, so. sure. And I like doing business with them; they seem like a nice company. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I I just found one on Banggood. Um, it'll do up to six S, which is like nominally twenty two point two volts, um, five volts, uh, you know, output and three amps. So um, let's see if I can. Sorry, I. I found the package. This thing is Castle Creations. All right. And uh, this particular battery eliminator, 10 amp max output, a 68 volt input maximum, a 4.8 to 9.0 selectable output. Oh, yeah. I'm on their website. What's the model number? Oh, it doesn't say. It just says. Oh, it, 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 I found it's a 10 amp one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've got it. Cool. Thank you. So 65 volt max input and a 4.8 to 9 volt output. Hey, Dave, can you write down down those facts in the chat? Sure. I'll just I'll tell you what, I'll just post the URL. Okay. Oh, okay, even better. I'm on the wrong computer. <laughs> I'm using my desktop. But yeah, if you just search Castle Creations for the CCBEC 10 amp, 10 a you'll find it. There's yeah. only one problem. But a, week, but a week from now, if it's in the chat, we'll have it forever. So yeah. that's why when you put a link, if you put the chat that chat link, it'll be, it, we make a record of that. Yeah. So can you put that in, Murray? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll have to get, I'm only, I'm on two different computers. I'm on the Mac for this, and then I'm on my desktop behind me. I just searched on the wrong computer. But yes, I will. Hold on. I found it. I put it in there. Steve's got it. Yeah. Well, if that one comes with recommendations, I'll just go with that one. That's. I mean, I just need something that works. Wow. <laughs> that's that's the one I use. I use that on a couple different robots. Okay. Hey, Dave. How much was it? Ooh, it might have been kind of pricey. Uh, twenty-two dollars. It's twenty-two yeah. bucks on this page, yeah. yeah. Um, twenty bucks or something like that. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me let me see if I got another. Hang on. And the factory default voltage is five point one volts. Yay! Yeah, you wouldn't want to short that thing out. Ten <laughs> amps. <laughs> no. Well, if you get if you get really serious, uh, this is the one that I use on my helicopter. Wow! And uh, yeah, it's a big mama. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And uh, because, as I say, the uh, uh, that's also Castle Creations, and I don't have. It comes in a nicer bag, so it must have cost more money. <laughs> so. So, David, what are the volts and amps on your biggest helicopter? Oh, it's a 222-volt, uh, uh, 5,000 milliamp-hour packs. So call it 44 volts at 5,000 milliamp-hours. But that means it could deliver 5 amps over an hour. But we actually suck those things down really hard and fly them for about 10 minutes at somewhere between 100 amps and Maybe twice that. Wow. And then you've got some warm batteries, don't you? Yeah, the whole thing gets warm. But I do have, uh, I think I sent you the plots for that Eagle Tree. Yeah, uh, data logger. I've got, yeah, and that data logger, I have uh, temperature probes that I put on the battery packs and on the motor and on the BEC. So I can track that uh, and compare that. Let's see, it says this guy, uh, again, it's 4.8 to 12.5 volts. Uh, 50 volt max input, 20 amp output. 
And you know what? The, those big helicopters, they're, you know, burning that much power, they're scary. They really are scary. <laughs> you, you have these blades that are, uh, you know, uh, three feet long, uh, uh, carbon fiber machetes, uh, spinning 2,000 RPM. The tip speed's around 200 miles an hour. And, uh, you know, it, it could not just kill you if, if it ran into you. It could probably kill you if it ran into you and you were sitting in your car. <laughs> uh, so, and what, what I've learned in my old age is that uh, that adrenaline rush, uh, when I was a young man, uh, that was excitement. Uh, but now that, I'm, now that I'm drooping into old fartdom, that adrenaline rush is terror. <laughs> well, what did, what did you always say? You know, uh, you put a rotating blade on the, on a robot. What could go wrong? You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> especially one that you know, uh, flying radio control airplanes. Uh, you don't crash very much, and when you do, you poke a hole in the wing or you break a blade or something like that. It's something easy to fix. You break off the landing gear or something like that. The helicopters, when they crash because there's so much angular momentum. They tear themselves into a thousand little pieces. There's not much left from the helicopter. And it can happen in just milliseconds. It's oh, just. Man. Done. A thousand dollars or more. Right? The trick is to make it happen right in the garbage can so you don't have to pick up the pieces. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dave, did you ever, did you ever fly? Um, there used to be. Um, a place called um, North Lake in Capel. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, we used to live in Capel, and my wife and I uh, would ride bikes up there and, um, you know, watch the guys with the airplanes and the helicopters and stuff. And, um, no matter what time you went up there, you could always go up and look in one of the barrels and see these, you know, very nicely finished, mangled, you know, plane bodies, you know, and then there'd, there'd be a guy there with, you know, he'd have the salvaged pile of parts, you know, landing gear, maybe an engine, uh, you know, whatever didn't get destroyed in the process. But uh, there was uh, a guy, I, a guy I used to fly with, he passed away a few years ago, but he would refer to his helicopter as whether it was in its solid state or its liquid state. <laughs> liquid state is when it's a bunch of parts spread out all over the top of the workbench and the solid state is when you could actually point to somebody and say look there's my helicopter that's not the helicopter yeah very nice yeah so carl what are we going to do saturday you're going to give a you're going to set one for one right saturday i'll uh, i'll send something out for one o'clock dallas time and uh, it'll be just like, I'll block two hours. My presentation is, I'll keep it under an hour this time. You guys don't need to see all that I did for the startups I presented to. And then, uh, and then we'll, uh, maybe I'll even fly through faster and we'll leave more time for people to share. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. I'll get right. to you sometime tomorrow. Uh, Doug, I just, I just have, I still have some more work. I should probably finish tonight, and then uh, I got to get up early tomorrow. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to drop off. Hey, thanks, yeah. guys. This was really yep. good. Bye, bye. Yeah, probably the same here. See you, Doug. All right. See you, Doug. Bye. Guys, you have a. Uh, if there's nothing else, anyone else want to stay on and chat, or uh, shall we call it a wrap and look forward to Saturday? Sure. Uh, I'll see you on Saturday. Yeah. Okay. If I can get Saturday. Or Sunday. Take care. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good to see you guys. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.